December 11th, 2021, a crisp morning to start off a good day. We are here in Chino, California, getting ready for the city of Chino's annual Christmas parade. After the parade, we will head up Route 66 to San Bernardino where our club is having its annual Christmas luncheon at the world famous First McDonald's. While we're at the First McDonald's, we will get a tour from one of the curators. And after that, we'll get some of the guys to show us their vehicles. So stay tuned for a fun day with the club and cruise with us on Route 66. Stage before the parade. Look at everybody practicing. Say hi to YouTube, everybody. Hi, hi YouTube. Hi. Awesome. <laughs> Hi guys! Hi! Hello. Say hi to you two! Hi you two! How are you today? <laughs>
Hi, good morning. What we got? If we ever get in. We're having a pen eagle. Wow. Yes, because penguins don't fly, but eagles do. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Good morning.
Southern California Military Vehicle Collectors Club. you know about Chino Cares. We have started a movement of want to be a part of the community. Communities across the country are dividing over the differences, but Chino is different. We want to unite under the one thing we all have in common. We care about this community. After the parade, we regrouped and headed north on Highway 83 for a few miles, then turned east on Route 66 toward San Bernardino.
Mario at the first McDonald's. He's uh, responsible for putting us all together. Uh, we're having our little Christmas party here, and uh, we all brought our vehicles. So I just want to say thank you, Mario, for everything that you've done. All right. I'm glad everybody could make it. The food's hot. Let's eat. Let's eat. <laughs> Albert Akura, the owner of Juan Pollo. Uh, he also owns this. Uh, where we're at right now, the museum, and then across the street, he owns the, uh, the first McDonald's as well. Uh, special thanks to him. He always invites us out to the Amboy. He owns Amboy as well. And uh, we want to just say really uh, thank you very much. We have so much fun out there. So uh, thank you very much for having us out there and inviting us. Thank you for attending. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. Out, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's a real fun time. Yeah, I hope it gets back to where it was. We had airplanes, the skydivers. Yeah, that was awesome. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that was it was a real good time. So, uh, just want to say thank you and thank you for having us here and uh, our club and all the guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm Ben Miller. Um, it's a 42 Ford World War II staff car. Um, found it in Texas um, years ago on eBay, brought it in, it wasn't running, so I had to get it running, kind of change the gas tank, kind of get it running, and then um, the interior was totally blown out, so I had an interior, found an original 42 Ford interior put in it, and, and drove it, uh, yeah, I've had it for probably, um, I don't know, 15 years. Oh, cool. And then just recently I had a pain, I was driving it just the way it was, the way I got it forever, but... I remember that, yeah. People kept saying, oh, your car's so ugly, man, you need to paint that thing. So uh, I finally broke down and painted it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so yeah, I, I love going to parades in it and um, doing displays. And um, I, I reenact World War II, so I, this is my car I drive to reenactments. I like to do swing dancing, so I, it's my car to drive to swing dances. And anything World War II related. I take this, you know. Oh, sweet. But I wanted that staff car so I could drive it on the freeway. Because uh -huh. I'm always driving like long distances and wanted to be able to drive on the freeway. So basically, this is my freeway, freeway capable MV. Uh -huh, right on. There you go. Yeah. What kind of engine is that in It's a flathead V8. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can we take a look at it? Uh, it's filthy. I'd rather oh, okay. Yeah, All I right. To, I need to detail my engine bay. <laughs> okay. Sweet. Anyway. <laughs> It's got three in the tree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweet. My my seat's kind of worn out, so I, I need to get new seats. So I have, that's why I have the GI blanket on this because the seats are all blown out. But oh, suicide doors, awesome. Yeah, suicide doors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna replace the fabric. You'll see fabric here pretty soon, but. Otherwise, it's uh, presentable. Yeah, I like it. <clears throat> Very cool. Yeah. All right, thank you, Ben. Yeah. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Yo. Hey, it's Big Earn here. I'm here with Ezra. He's one of the curators here. 
at the first McDonald's. He's going to show us around. So this is the original office right here that the brothers had when they first converted to their hamburger stand in 1948. And this was the garage where also they had their early 1940s Ford uh, style vehicle. Now the rest of the building on the left, from my right side over, the left to your viewership, was the potato prep room. Back before you had this whole processed food, you had the frozen fries brought in. You had, the brothers had all their resources uh, locally supplied. So they had a local spud farmer who once a week would bring a truckload of potatoes to this area. And, we're, and in this building originally is where the brothers had them clean, pretty much clean, rinsed, peeled, air dried, before they were then taken into the restaurant building itself to be put through, which is on display inside the museum, into one of the front, one of several uh, French fry cutters that would be the process of making original McDonald's french fries. Yeah. Well, before we enter inside, this is another structure that survived from being destroyed in 1972. This is what structurally is left of the original sign that's been standing here since the 1940s. Oh. It's been modified between different ownerships. If you saw the movie, uh, The Founder, you know that after the McDonald's brothers sold to Ray Kroc in 61, one of the first things to go was the entail rights to the Arches, the Speedy, the name McDonald's, so those were removed. And then from the next ownership from 1961 up until 1998, you had different modifications to the sign. But structurally, it's the same thing that's been standing here. And this was saved from a neighbor who prevented a bulldozer from taking it down. Mm. So this, along with the building in the back, are the only two structures that survived from being destroyed in 1972. Wow. All right, so let's... Oh, this is Jack Marcus. He's our main curator at the museum. This museum here consists of over 80 years worth of memorabilia stretching back from when the brothers originally started as a barbecue restaurant up until the most recent decade. So you'll see things from the 40s up until 2020. <laughs> oh, wow. And the oldest items are in this corner over here. This is including uh, frame photos of the early workers, and these are mostly from the barbecue years. This is when the brothers originally operated as a drive-in barbecue from 1940 until 1948. And here, as I was mentioning earlier, this is one of the little potato press cutters that was the last step before it was they were turned into these electric fry baskets to be made into the McDonald's french fries that we know today. And these are original pieces from this location. Hmm. Over the next few rows, we have an assortment of different items. The pictures frames up here kind of show the... Well, they have some pictures from other locations, but it's heavily pictures of this site from 1940 up until 1968 when the brothers went through three phases, which was the first phase was the barbecue restaurant, second being the McDonald's hamburgers we know today. And then you have the last phase was after the Biome 61 when they had to rename themselves as the Big M for legal reasons. And we have this, the next cases in this section are items donated from other countries. So you have here items from Germany, Finland, Russia, China, Japan, Brazil, Australia, Canada. Pretty much representing, encompassing the wide variety of McDonald's memorabilia from around the world showing how it's both common, similar to ours, but unique in its own way. And right now, Canada and Brazil and Japan are our largest donators. Oh, in addition to Scotland. <laughs> And then these are new exhibits. These are items that are focused on decades. So this low case here is items from the 1980s. That's what I remember. I remember those styrofoams. 
<laughs> yeah, that's a, thing, that's a callback a lot of people know from that decade <laughs> years to deteriorate. So I guess at the time we think we know better, but we actually don't. <laughs> what, what do we got here? These uh, all belonged in the... Well, except for the room, had all these other items here were part of a, don of a memorial collection that was set up. Uh, I mentioned Danny, a colleague of Jack. Danny had a friend who had an, had an untimely passing, and these were his items. So we put it here as a bit of a memorial testimony. But there's a few items that actually have connection to the city of San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. Kind of like this cart is from Sage's Market. Now, in the local area, we have a, we have a well-known uh, grocery store chain called uh, Stater Brothers. Mm -hmm. Before Stater Brothers, the dominant supermarket in the area was Sage's Market. So this is kind of a relic of that of that bygone era of another company that was once dominant in the area. Wow. Cool. Yeah. All right. So this here is the, the mil he, like, this here is the military museum portion of yeah, our collection. Like, this property was also owned by my boss Albert Cora, but this site is dedicated to the military history of the region as well as to veterans who served from the town in the past conflicts as far back as World War One in our collection. And. Kind of like that story, there isn't really much of a, say, organization, like a certain block for each period, but there is a theme that goes for most of it. So you have some of the, you know, you have uniforms, you have equipment pieces, and then you have heavy equipment things, like, such as this giant uh, searchlight that belonged on the M48 M60 patent tanks that were used in the Vietnam era. Yeah. And this case was given to us by Jeff, by Jeff Nari, and he was he partook in the second Gulf War, and this is some a few capture items he had, including a, a Iraqi Republican Guard officer uniform, as well as some denarii, uh, some currency, and an AK-74 bayonet. <laughs> yeah, the denarii. A lot of Iraqi veterans tell me that it's fake. <laughs> well, not only fake, well, not, they're real, but he tells me that that's the most common thing that GIs, that, you know, American soldiers were able to bring back home with them. Because unlike 80 years ago in World War II, where it was much lenient, soldiers could literally send enemy guns back by mail home. Mm -hmm. You know, it became much more stricter, so it's, it's now whatever a soldier can be able to actually conceal on themselves. Mm -hmm. So something like paper money or photos or stuff. Are easy to pack than like a, than trying to stuff an AK in your backpack and try to send it. <laughs> also, you would be heavily punished now for trying to smuggle such uh, war trophies. Mm. That's why now currency flags. That's Mario. Yeah, that's Mario mm. Montesino. That was back in I want to say nineteen, yeah, sixty between nineteen sixty four or sixty five wow. when he was stationed in Korea on the DMZ zone. Mm -hmm. So this is his family in service, mm. and then this is his wife's family in service. Oh wow! Really and cool. yeah, so she had brothers that were serving in World War Two. Uh huh. And then the rest of the walls are from other people who served from World War, mostly World War Two, but you have also Korea, you have Vietnam. They have sprinkled in some of the late war conflicts mm -hmm. in the, of the 20th century that were also in that time period. What we have here too in this little corner, aside from the flat jacket, is a little few captured and themed uh, uh, Vemak or here items from World War II. Some of it is reproduction, such as on display, such as the MP40 here and the C98 uh, broom handle. But this uh, steel hand granata is a practice, is an actual practice one. This is what they, in the German military, they used the train troops to get used to throwing these and lugging these around before they felt comfortable laying these Okies of Bavaria to be allowed an actual <laughs> grenade to throw around. <laughs> the helmets are too. And then the interesting part of this, uh, this eagle here is that this came from a veteran. He got the, he found this on the floor that was destroyed from a train station. And this was originally hanging on the door of a train station and was falling on the floor in the combat. He just picked it up and took it and sent it home, and that became his war trophy. Wow. Like I said, back then you could get away with sending a lot of stuff back home compared to today. Uh huh. There you are. 
and these uniforms on these racks go from World War II up until the current day. So this is basically 80 years of uniforms mm -hmm. from the different branches, from all the major branches, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. And we're just waiting for a Space Force uniform to come in. Uh -huh, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then like the searchlights, these are the tanker helmets for that same M40, M60 Patton tanks. And then this side is where we have somewhat of a theme going. Each corner has the different, the major, the major branches aside from the Coast Guard. So you mm -hmm. have the Army, the Marine section, you have the Navy and the Air Force. And you have different gear spread out based on those different uh, themed eras. We have our own POW section here, MIA POW. And this is a copy of the statue that they have at the regional Riverside uh, National Cemetery that was dedicated back in 2004. Are these POWs from uh, San Bernardino area? They are just uh, POWs of the general organization. Oh, I got you. Yeah, if you go in certain cities around Southern California, uh -huh. you'll see in public parks their own, they have their own MIA POW memorials where they have listed for their town uh -huh. uh, people who are from their, you know, from their respective cities that are either classified as missing in action or war prisoners of war, but largely the missing in action part. Uh -huh. In fact, one memorial, I think, in neighboring Glendale lists people from World War One, like 16 people from World War I that are still considered missing from yeah. that, from their hometown. I mean, the term, remember, when you use the term missing, it's not usually as in there's no identify. You have to remember that in modern warfare, ordnance explosives can leave no trace of someone behind. Yeah. So someone could be, by that argument, classified as, M, as killed in action. But then since there's no evidence of that person, like any remnants, mm -hmm. it's, it's then classified as missing in action. In our marine section, we have two interesting items. We have this uh, raising of the flag of Iwo, on Mount Suribachi of Iwo Jima, signed by veterans of the three different marine divisions that partook in it. Wow. The 3rd, 4th, and 5th mm -hmm. Marine Division. Mm -hmm. And another interesting part is these MREs. We have two sets of MREs. One is from the more current recent issue, and then the one on, the, on my right side are actually MREs from the Vietnam years from the late 60s. So you can see the, some similarities about the transition greatly in, qual, in qual, mm -hmm. quality of these MREs. Something else I wanna point out in our collection here is this is a section right here to Albert Kors family. His family served in the military. His, his father and his uncle both served in the 442nd in World War II. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, his uncle was killed in action in France mm -hmm. in 1944. His father, though, came back and lived for almost to like I think the age of 101. And their their distant relative before they came to their family came to the United States was Momota Okora, as he showed earlier, and he was a veteran of what was called the Russo Japanese War of 1904-1905. This was the conflict that propelled Japan as an international power by defeating what was considered the pa most powerful nations of the Asiatic sphere, the Russian Empire. And right here we have an airborne section right here. On display is a number of patches and badges of the different, as well as copies of the bat of your wings for your jumps, as well as a set of a reserve and of a main and reserve parachute on the back and the bottom. And the next big thing we have is a 81 millimeter mortar that was given to us. Yeah, these type of mortars have been, I think, discontinued in the U.S. service, but you still see these pop around, especially in hot zones of Africa and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Especially groups like ISIS would be seen using mortars similar to these because, honestly, we produce so many of our equipment and weaponry that it's not surprising to find them in third world countries. Mm -hmm. And this here is more captured German stuff. This came from one veteran who served from, or a couple of veterans that served on different theaters from North Africa into the heart of Germany itself. So you see the different variety of these 
Germanic items. The most interesting is this blade right here. This isn't just a weapon, this is an initiation knife. And when Wehrmacht troops were graduating their basic training during the Nazi regime, this is where they would place, they would take an oath of faith or of dedication to Nazi Germany and above all to Adolf Hitler. This was basically sealing their fate on this Jeez. dagger. <laughs> this is also one of our oldest uniforms in this room. This is actually a World War I uniform, which are which my colleagues, uh, Mario and Arthur, actually found in a dumpster. Wow, really? Yes, yeah. they found this was being thrown out. Most likely, whoever originally wore this uniform probably had family that when he passed on, they probably didn't see any value or knew what this was, so they oh. probably tried to get rid of it. Oh, man. Not realizing the value implication of this. Because this is what's interesting about World War I uniforms. Before World War I, there was no... The units and divisions we have today didn't have official unit sig insignias, like the 1st Division, the 2nd Division, 3rd, 4th, yada, yada, yada. They didn't have their symbol. So when World War I came, divisions actually start introducing their own patches. And as this for the ADF right here, you know, a lot of these were handmade and hand sewn. Mm -hmm. So you'll see different variations of the same division because each soldier had their own interpretation of what their uh, division logo would be. Wow. But these would take root and would shape, take shape into what would be the official uh, division patches that would form in the interwar years before in World War II you had the official patches that designated each unit. And then this corner here would be our Air Force and Navy section. One of the popular sections of our Air Force and Navy are the Disney patches here. Walt Disney was a very active participant in moral support for the U.S. service, as well as producing propaganda films, which you can find a lot on YouTube mm -hmm. during the World Wars. And patches like these, these are reproductions, but they're based off of actual designs that were served. The only design that's still in continuation today would be the Seabees. The Seabees uh, Naval Construction Unit still uses the Bumblebee with the Tommy Gun as their, pretty much as their uh, unit's uh, insignia. That's the only thing that has not changed since 1940. That's all I can show on this thing. All right, hey, thank you, Ezra, for showing us around. Appreciate no problem. It. Like I say, you're always welcome back. Our museums, the Mil McDonald's Museum is open every day, 10 to 5. The Military Museum weekends, 11 to 5. Excellent. I'm here with Virgil, and he's going to show us Thor. <laughs> so, Thor is a 1990 M923A2 cargo troop carrier. Uh, I acquired Thor in September of 2017, spent a couple of years getting him mechanically sound and now we go out and do parades and events and been out to Joshua Tree, been to Glamis, tried Olds Oldsmobile Hill a couple of times, got halfway up, didn't quite make it. But anyway, so we wow, go out and try to have some fun. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> you said you're interested in going to Amboy with us, right? One yes, time. absolutely. I want to join the fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. Uh, you can tell it's a six by six, runs in four wheel drive most of the time, and then there's a dash lever and an airlock and engages six wheel drive. Uh, weighs 21,000 pounds, and uh, yeah, pretty much 21,000 pounds says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> For real, it's a, the crusher oh, there. Uh, uh, another fun fact <laughs> wheel and tire combination weighs about 490 pounds. My goodness, you bench that much? No. <laughs> uh, not, nothing happens quickly when I work on Thor. You just got to do it methodically because uh -huh. if, if the tire tips over, you know. It'll, yeah, it's going to hurt. hurt. It's going to so, hurt. <laughs> uh, but I did put new tires on it. They're split rims. Oh, wow. And I did, you did them yourself? I did them myself. Holy I cow. did one wheel tire each weekend. It took me six weekends. Holy cow. And a bit of cervezas. So. <laughs> it's the medicine for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you drive this everywhere. Yes. Try to get, uh, now that he's mechanically sound, go out and try and enjoy him as much as possible. Yeah, right? That's what I, that's what I like to do is drive mine. 
I don't I don't like to build them just to sit there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What kind of engines has got in it? It's a Cummins 8.3 liter turbo diesel. Made it to an Allison five speed automatic transmission. It has power steering, full air brakes. It's amazingly easy to drive once you get used to its size. <laughs> it fills the lanes, but it turns real easy. It brakes very quickly. You put it in drive and away you go. Slowly. Wow, slowly. But, yeah. <laughs> It'll yeah. do 62 miles an hour on the freeway. Oh, all right on. And so it, it, it does uh -huh. do highway speeds fairly well. Uh -huh. It takes a minute to get up to speed, but yeah. once you're there, it, I did install, this isn't the military winch, but I did install a 25,000 pound front winch, uh, electric 24 volt, and similarly, I have one on the back. Oh, okay. Just in case, huh? <laughs> yeah, because I, I would do some Jeep runs uh -huh. out in Joshua Tree, and one of the organizers came up to me and said, you know, Virgil, yeah. if you get stuck, we can't help you. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, you get a point. Uh, <laughs> note taken. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Can I see inside the cab? Absolutely. It's a little. Yeah. Insulation uh -huh. in the interior. Uh, added uh, 18 wheeler sun visors. Oh. Driving through Palm Springs, coming home. Yeah. At the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> Holds 77 gallons of fuel, diesel fuel. I put a winch up to get the spare tire out. Oh, yeah. Normally it has that chain block and tackle yeah. system. I'm getting too old for that. Noisy too, uh, <laughs> driving, yeah, right? <laughs> oh, fun little feature I added. So right here is a 12 volt supply. So truck's a 24 volt truck. And about a year ago, I came across a stranded BMW and they asked me if I could give them a jump. And I said, I actually really can't without <laughs> taking apart and getting uh -huh. into the batteries. So uh, I went down the block, out my other truck, and helped them out. But then I went, I'm going to put a civilian stuff just in case, so yeah. I can hook a set of jumpers up and try uh -huh. and help people out. Wow, yeah. that is cool. All right, thanks, Virgil. Appreciate it. <laughs> this is Gary. He's going to show us his 41 WC3. Yes, sir. This is my my WC3. Uh, when I bought it, I didn't even know really what it was. I thought it was an old Dodge Army truck and with some help from the guys in the, the club at that time when i first joined we uh, learned and figured out that it was a wc3 an early one as it still has civilian gauges and not the military uh we took this thing down it was at one point two frame rails four tires and a steering wheel so it's been a frame off restoration wow. took four trucks to make the one good cap um, and she's a, a hoot to drive <laughs> I can always tell the, the kids if you can start it, you can drive it because nobody's been able to figure it out yet. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, she's a, a six cylinder flathead still, single speed transfer case, uh, original wood bed. It's all got the, the windshield, got canvas for it. My wife called it the skirt. <laughs> um, if I can get my front wheels on it, I can climb it. So. Nice. She's a lot of fun. And here you see the, the civilian gauges still instead of the military versus the military. Oh, yeah. The original fire extinguisher over on the right hand side. The original seats, these were fun. I drove all the way up to Lake Tahoe to get these because the only models that use these, there's the half ton open cab and the ambulance. So I found a pair for sale up in Lake Tahoe and I drove all the way up to get those. Holy cow, what, a nine yeah. hour drive, one way? Each way, yeah, round, uh, yeah, plus a round trip. I remember when you did these. Yeah. Tell us the story of that. Well, these are, uh, 
one of those trading up things. Uh -huh. I was at a junkyard and I found a set of rims and I, I put those up on uh, the internet, sold the rims, yes. took that money, and I bought the, the bows for the, for the canvas because these are one piece steam bent oak uh, bows. They're, they're the correct ones. The bed I had, I, I milled all the lumber for the, the bed myself since uh, nobody wanted to do the, the correct kind of bed. That's usually what happens. And uh, <laughs> you gotta do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, this this weekend she's sporting her first trip out with her brand new stainless steel gas tank. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. We got the uh, the original uh, king bee or queen bee marble reflectors. Mm -hmm. And those are next to impossible to find. <laughs> hmm. What else can I tell you about it? Had it for 26 or 27 years now. Have you really? Yeah. Wow. I've seen this thing in various conditions. Uh -huh. Tore apart, engine out. Yeah. The whole front end off of front it. Front end yeah. off of it. <laughs> yeah. Dusty as crazy. Yeah, that's when it, yeah. she, got, she got resealed at that time. Uh huh. I remember that. She would, when you <laughs> park it, she would mark her spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a nice machine right there. These are particular to the early half ton. And they're a blue lens with louvers. Those are the blackouts. Yeah. They drive me crazy. They've got so many bad dead batteries for those things. Yeah. Because you can't see them unless you're 50 feet away. <laughs> Can we see the engine? Sure. Let me, uh, you got to put the windshield up to do that. Safety belt down. So we got the bug, bug thing up. Mm -hmm. Come around on this side. Old clamshell. Here we go. Little flathead Dodge Six with the General Motors alternator. Here's the Mia. Prop it. Pause it for just a second. There, and I'll, uh, I'll fire it up for you. Okay. Toy. All right, Gary, thanks a lot for All showing right, that man. to us. All that right. was awesome. <laughs>